So life cycle thinking. Uh, how many people in this room, uh, we don't have a camera on you now, uh, would say you know, they don't understand the concept of a life cycle, what this picture means? It's OK to say, no, I don't get it. Product life cycles, materials, like where the materials come from, the manufacturing of a product, the distribution of the product. I say it's a coffee maker, right? Coffee maker is made out of glass and other parts. So the glass comes from somewhere, and then it's formed into a pot. And then you know, uh, maybe rail takes it to a distribution hub, and a truck takes it to Target, and then your car takes it home, and then you use it. Since we have coffee drinkers in this class, I think it's good to use that example. And then something happens to your coffee maker at the end of its life. You know, maybe you trash it or uh, bring it over to the uh, reuse center or something like that. Uh, perhaps components get remanufactured or the glass gets recycled. Uh, is this idea familiar to people? OK, then we're not going to dwell on it. Okay. So life cycle thinking means when you are selecting a technology or you are uh, establishing a policy, you're doing a design, you're thinking about all this. OK, so let's take the example of a vehicle. Okay. Uh, you see a lot of unit processes here, right? Just to get to the metal ingot, you know, if we think about iron, you got the iron ore, it's coming from the ground. Uh, you got some coal and some limestone. If it's aluminum, it's coming from bauxite, etc. cetera. Uh, that metal uh, gets formed, it gets machined, uh, gets assembled into a vehicle, not just the metal parts, of course. You got plastic parts, you got electronic parts, uh, foam, etc. cetera. Uh, you uh, basically put those vehicles on a truck. Uh, to go to a, a dealer, you pick up your vehicle from the dealer, you drive it around for uh, you know, 20 years or so, or you, know, so you drive it for seven, and so you sell it, and somebody else drives it around. Gets retired, perhaps abandoned on the road, you hope not. Uh, then the vehicle uh, you know, basically enters the end of life stream, uh, gets shredded, or some of the components that are useful might get remanufactured, perhaps an alternator or something like that. Uh, then the shredded scrap gets sorted. Uh, some metals get recycled. Uh, a lot of the plastics, at least in the US, don't get treated at all, end up in a landfill, what have you. So this is an example of life cycle stages of an automobile. Is anything missing here? There's almost no arrows going back. No arrows going back. Well, there are a few, Jeff, inside. So like the shredder residue. Oh, that's not a good example. Uh, let's see. Uh, somewhere we've got, yeah, recycled parts here. So this is a little small to see. Uh, but there is some recycling going on. Yeah, so we've got shredded uh, uh, steel scrap here, or iron scrap, and that comes back in the ingot. And then some of that goes to make a new vehicle. I assume there also would be a lot of repairs on the car. Can I take out one part and put in a new one somewhere during the life cycle? So repairs, uh, that's part stockage okay. going into the auto and use. Consumables like wiper fluid, uh, that's here too. Go ahead. Energy input? Say again? Energy input? Uh, to what? To anything. Like the when you assemble the automobile, you need electricity, for instance. So or fuel fuels. is an example, Yeah. right? So these are unit processes. Now, we haven't listed you know, what's coming in and what's coming out of these unit processes. But uh, here, uh, you would assume that's what's going on. So if this is a life cycle of a car, and you're, you're um, producing your metal ingot, or maybe converting your metal ingot into a fabricated part and machining it, in LCA, you look at the materials and energy consumption going in. You look at the emissions going out. So they're not actually shown here. But in a life cycle assessment, that's what you're doing. So to ask more specifically the question, what unit processes might be missing? You think we nailed it? Steve? I don't see anything related to uh, repairs or in usage modifications to the vehicle. So customization of the car after you bought it, not included uh, per se. I mean, you could say this part stockage is part of that, so that's, you know, you're replacing a fender and getting in an accident, what have you. Go ahead. Courtney? Resources you need to extract the raw materials in the first place? 
So, uh, coal, uh, you know, you might think that, you know, you need a, a, a truck uh, to help you produce the coal, and maybe the outcome here is a truck, so you need a truck to make a truck. Uh, this isn't, yeah, yeah, that's where we're going, right? Uh, so, it's not explicitly said, you know, minor helmets. Go ahead, Marco. Yeah, the fuel to run a car and customer use. Let's call that a consumable. Okay. Also, transportation between each stage of getting the material. Yeah, it's not explicitly said, right? This uh, auto release for shipment implies it's getting on a truck, but you know, clearly there's a lot of transportation going on here. You know, if your iron is being mined in Minnesota and the steel is being made in Gary, Indiana, there's a boat in between, not listed here. So apparently, you need a boat to make a truck. So there's some, uh, go ahead. Uh, like buildings that are needed for manufacturing? And yeah, the capital infrastructure not mentioned, and we can you know, jump off of that. And you know, how about the roads, right? You don't have a car without roads. Uh, you know, how about stoplights? How about culvert? How about gas stations? How about radar detectors? Uh, how about the uh, servers that they use to send you your ticket when you get caught speeding, uh, uh, hospital beds. <coughs> this is just the infrastructure. Uh, this is um, uh, you're looking at aggregate and cement, steel, et cetera. The materials used per uh, million dollars of construction costs. A lot of material in the automotive uh, infrastructure. And you can come up with a very similar diagram uh, for the infrastructure as we did for the car. Okay, looking at the bridges and the cables and the rebar uh, going into that, looking at cement and pavement, etc. Anything we haven't talked about? Go ahead. The people? Ah, uh, people, yeah. So, well, we could get into the manufacture of people. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, what you know, what we often don't think about is you know the time. You know, when when you put somebody in a car, so to be a little bit more serious about that, so Courtney, I think you have a good point. You know, I'm in a car. I'm not doing something else, right? So maybe I, you know, I was at home, and you know, I've I've got you know giant burger lamps in my house, and you know, I have my my house at 95 degrees in the middle of winter. And um, you know, I run stereos really loud, and I got 20 computers, and uh, so I, you know, I leave the house, I get in my car, and I actually have less impact by getting in my car, right? And it's interesting. I mean, think about how we use our time by being in a car. It means we're not doing something else. And we usually think about cars as being, you know, driving around is very polluting, and it is. Uh, but it means we're not doing something else, and the reverse is true also. Yeah, it gets into opportunity comes. Dr. Sean? Um, I was thinking sort of upstream processes for fuel manufacturing and refining. Is that? Yeah, so consumables, you know, it's clear that uh, you've got um, fuel coming from somewhere, right? So uh, there was a disaster in the Gulf not too long ago. Some of you may remember. A lot of us probably forgot already. Uh, that probably had something to do with this right? at some level some probability of a disaster. Right? Obviously, we use oil for other things, too. So, you know, you can go on and on and on and on and on until you found yourself in Siberia. So, uh, you know, this used to be harder. So an axiom is something you can't prove, but it's kind of intuitive in some way. That you can connect the life cycle of any product to Siberia. These days, all you got to say is climate change, and climate change is going to affect Siberia, so it's okay, that's easy. Uh, but the fact is, you know, something came from Siberia somehow. Yeah, maybe it's a, uh, a leather seat and, you know, the cattle came from Siberia. I don't know. I don't know Siberian economics very well, but, uh, you know, that's why this isn't very scientific. But the point is, we think about connecting everything to everything else. Uh, it makes it very difficult to uh, communicate what we mean by a life cycle assessment. Right? You have to, at some point, say that, you know, this is in the analysis and this isn't. And that's the difference between life cycle thinking 
where you need to think about everything. I have a policy. How's that policy going to affect Siberia? New technology, how's it going to affect Siberia? Or whatever, right? It could be the people. It could be um, economic development in a, in a lesser uh, developed country. It could be anything, right? That's life cycle thinking. Life cycle assessment is a methodology. It is a standard, let's call it an accounting procedure, codified uh, in the International Standards Organization, ISO uh, 14040 series. It's a method, and it's a prescription. And there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. And this class really isn't about how to do life cycle assessments. But what uh, we are going to be covering today in the next period is characteristics of good LCAs. So you can read one and know if it's good or not. So the formal definition, LCA, standard methodology to evaluate the environmental consequences of a product holistically or a product or an activity. It can be a service. It can be anything, really, across its entire life. Go ahead. Methodology. Um, how do you explain the discrepancies between the quality of a life cycle assessment? Can you hold that question for about 12 minutes? It, yeah, that, that's exactly where the rubber meets the road. Because even though you've got a standard set of steps to follow, uh, there's a lot of judgment within the, the methodology. <coughs> And explaining that judgment, those judgment calls, and those assumptions, uh, that's what separates good LCA from bad LCA. Okay, so hopefully uh, that becomes clear. You know, if you are in a specific sector, the coffee maker sector, you could imagine a very specific prescription for how to do an LCA of a coffee maker. Right? But ISO 14040, this series tries to cover everything. So the steps are general. And again, there's a lot of judgment involved. And I'll, again, we'll go through a couple of examples of this, and hopefully you'll, you'll get the idea. There are four stages in a life cycle assessment. Goal definition and scoping. That's one, step one. Uh, step two is the inventory analysis. Step three is the impact analysis. And step four is the interpretation analysis. But you, you need to be thinking interpretation all along. OK, so it kind of sounds like it comes at the end. And it does come at the end, but you don't want to be thinking about interpretation the whole way through. Because as you think about how a reader of your LCA may interpret the information you're presenting, you may actually need to go collect different data. Okay, So four stages. Uh, this is an informal uh, in-class exercise, uh, so no paper involved. Let's vote. Which stage do you think is the most challenging? We haven't defined them yet. That's what makes this interesting. Four stages, goal definition and scoping, inventory, impact, interpretation. You got to vote for one. Who votes for goal definition and scoping? That is a majority. That is a super majority. All right, uh, I'm going to call that 80%. Uh, inventory analysis. All right, I'll vote for it. I'll vote for it. Nobody's voting for it. All right, I got to vote for that one. Uh, impact analysis. Yes. Okay, that's about fifteen percent. Interpretation. All right, about well, maybe ten and ten. Uh, so uh, we've got eighty, zero, ten, and ten, percentage wise. Okay. I think you know where I'm going with this. You could probably defend any of these answers. So goal definition, folks, who wants to tell us why you voted for that? Go ahead. Um, if you don't have a good uh, goal definition, you can't even start the whole process. You can't get what you want until you know what you want. So it's important. So you're making a case that it's immensely important. Does that mean it's hard? And sometimes, you know, when, when my birthday is coming up, I have a hard time deciding what I want. Right? It feels really hard, but really it's probably in the scale of things not that hard. Mike? It's hard because, like you said, it could go all the way back to Siberia. So. Yeah, so the scoping part. You know, what do you include, what do you not include? Exactly. That, that, that is hard. Go ahead. You have to know what you want before you can work towards it. So firstly, goal definition, if you, if you define your goal, then you can work towards getting where you want to go. Right. So if you remove this piece, the whole thing's going to fall down. 
How about it's inventory? Oh, that was me. Uh, okay. Uh, well, you know, this is a data collection process. How many people would say they're um, quite familiar with LCN? Go ahead. So don't be shy. You've got one back there. I kind of sheepishly. There are a few of you who've taken a whole course on this topic. So uh, you know, that's, that's just being shy. Data is hard. So I raised my hand because you know I do this stuff and I've written papers in this area. It's the data in my mind. Like the rest of it, if you do a few of these, no problem. Where do you get the data? So I vote for that one. Uh, impact. Who voted for impact? Uh, go ahead, sir. Um, well, if you're using a new technology, even if you test it out in a lab, you have no idea how it's going to affect you know, people or the environment or whatever. And so you don't know the impact of your product until it's actually out there impacting, and you can't really affect that. Some things are unforeseen, right? So that's why they are called in unintended consequences. CFCs are a good example of that, right? It's a great solution for refrigeration. Bust a hole in the ozone layer. A big problem. Nobody saw that coming. Actually, it solved a lot of problems, right? So now alternatives we're, we're looking at. And what else on impact? I got it. If we take a pollutants, for instance, we know that toxicology is very, very complicated, especially because we can estimate the effect of one compound and the effect of another one, but we would have to calculate what the aspect of the synergies, and we have several th tens of thousands of chemicals, and we cannot calculate the effect of each of them and not of each uh, of the combinations. Exactly. So that, that's really true. We want to talk about the impact of, of chemicals on people. Let's just use the probability of getting cancer as one example, right? So what is the carcinogenicity of one compound versus another? Uh, what does it even mean? Do you ever, are you ever exposed to it in isolation? We don't test these things on humans, thank goodness. So uh, we'll never know, right? So and in, in not just in isolation, but in combination, as I mentioned. I mean, let's just take peanut butter, right? I mean, you know, uh, you're not supposed to give your kid peanut butter when they're really young. Uh, I mean, we don't know which kid can take the peanut butter and which one can. You just kind of try it, right? And just hope for the best. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of the state of things when it comes to humans, right? And that's humans, and we care about humans. What about frogs, you know, and, and trees and, you know, other, you know, organisms that are out there we might care about? Fish, you know, I, I like fish. Uh, so, impact analysis is tough, right? Uh, for a lot of reasons. And then not just the endpoint, I mean, just the transport. Is, is difficult. Go ahead. Uh, including the frogs, also uh, it's on the goal definition or no, like scoping? So yeah, we, we'll actually define these things. <laughs> we'll get around to that uh, eventually here. But uh, what you do is you define what you're looking at. So you can do like a life cycle energy analysis. And you're probably not talking about frogs there. Uh, if you're doing a comprehensive LCA, uh, you really should be looking at all the media. And uh, you know, especially if something has to do with water. You're probably talking about ecotoxicity, and there you're getting close to your frogs. So uh, in your goal definition, you're saying what you're doing, and that ought to make it clear. If it's inappropriate, like, for instance, if I'm looking at a metalworking fluid, I'll talk about what those are in just a second. Now, they're, they're big water pollutants. And you know, if I decide I'm not going to look at water pollutions, I'm just going to look at energy and their life cycle, like that really takes a lot of justifying. Part of this methodology is being transparent about your assumptions and describing why you're doing things. So uh, that comes out here in the first stage. How about interpretation? That's Steve. Because once you have gotten all of these uh, very good results, you've gathered all this data, you have to think about uh, how you can present it in such a way that it's not going to be misinterpreted by someone who just reads your abstract. Like you need to while you're going along, think, what am I going to write at the end of this? And what do I need to append such that it doesn't get misused? That's an excellent point, right? You're going to make a, uh, some claim or present some data about a material, some engineering material. And any of us as engineers can figure out how to use that material for good or for evil, right? And uh, studies do get manipulated. So how, the presentation uh, is an important part of the interpretation. Anything else on interpretation? Go ahead. Once you have all your different impacts, you have to figure out a way to compare different types of impacts. Yeah. Like, how do you compare uh, 
like global warming potential against biodiversity loss or water Perfect. quality impacts. Perfect. So uh, we're going to spend about 30 minutes on the next period talking about that very issue. Uh, uh, Catherine? Um, also, you have to consider like if you're working on like a hot topic or you know a very touchy subject, how your opposition would view what your your like everything that you've done. So you know, just from the beginning, having an open mind, being well, how would they take this? How would you know? How do I make it so that it it works for everybody, not just for one side or another? That's an excellent point. So every LCA is going to be peer reviewed at the end of the day. And uh, that's part of the methodology. So peer review and, and the composition of that peer review becomes very important. So uh, go ahead. It's also tough to identify what is good and bad. Uh, I think you've selected more than one uh, state. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I'm trying to help. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, coming back to the example you gave uh, a while ago about the car, uh, maybe driving a car is bad but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily worse than anything. It might be better to drive than to do something else. So it giving all interpretation. depends on the context of what's being displayed. Yeah. And that makes interpretation very difficult. You've helped immensely. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. So I think you're getting the feel. We haven't even defined these things yet. And you're getting a feel for it, uh, which is fantastic. I want to use these metalworking fluids as an example, mostly because it's our example, we could give other examples, but you know, we've done a ton of work here, and it's something people usually haven't seen, so uh, it's interesting. And uh, you know, I'll say more about why it's interesting in a second, but first, you know, what are these things? So when you cut metal, uh, or form metal, uh, here cutting metal, uh, the tools get hot. So you can imagine this is a milling operation going on here, I think, and you can't really see because of all the cutting fluid there. It looks like milk. And from the standpoint of a bacteria, it may as well be milk, but really they're emulsions, uh, oil droplets suspended in water. And you think about why they use these uh, micro emulsions as uh, metalworking fluids. Uh, you know, it makes some uh, sense at some level. So if the tool is getting hot, I want to cool it off, and water is a nice um, you know, heat removal mechanism. And I want to also uh, uh, sort of uh, reduce the generation of that heat. So the way to do that is to reduce friction. So let's put oil. But oil and water don't mix, right? So you've got to get them to mix. The way you do that is you add surfactants. So much like you use soap to clean your hands, uh, get the dirt off your hands, you emulsify the oil in the water. So it sounds like a simple system, but uh, you know, it's inherently unstable. So usually you're going to have tubes for uh, surfactants in that system just to you know, keep this stuff stable long enough to use it. Then uh, you've got water, so you've got to be concerned about rust. So you put a corrosion inhibitor in it. Uh, soaps, foam. All right, so factants, foam. So you've got to have something in there to get the foam down. So let's put a defoamer in there. Uh, bugs grow in it. Uh, something like a billion uh, bugs per milliliter of fluid or more if they're unchecked. So you've got to put biocides in here, usually multiple biocides, because you've got fungus, you've got bacteria. And it goes on and on and on. It becomes a lasagna of chemicals. In chemistry. Uh, typical cutting fluid will have about 20 components in it. Okay. So it's interesting because they're widely used. Something like 2 billion uh, gallons a year, roughly. Uh, life cycle costs 12% uh, of metals <coughs> manufacturing costs. This will blow your mind, right? Because there's tools here, uh, there's other uh, operations going on, labor, what have you. Uh, just in terms of metals manufacturing, about 12%. And that is because you don't just uh, buy the fluid, uh, you have to maintain it. Uh, let's talk about the health effects of having microorganisms in these fluids. So uh, they can range uh, from, uh, well, if you, if you look at a uh, publication by NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safe, uh, Safety and Health, uh, there's about 130 pages of illnesses or description of illnesses a lot of cancers that machinists are more likely to get than the rest of the population. So that's in part because of the chemistry of the fluids and the exposure to that chemistry. Uh, there are also um, uh, potential for infection. Uh, the biocides that keep the um, bacterial populations lower, those biocides tend to, con to cause dermatitis. So there's another health issue there. 
So uh, the microorganisms also eat the fluid. So not only do you have sort of uh, physical deterioration of the fluid, but you also have biological consumption. Like they love surfactants, for instance. So uh, you've got a whole soup of things going on here that lead to an ultimate need to replace the fluids. And that's a resource consumption issue. We talked about biochemical oxygen demand last time. That's a concern with these fluids. Uh, maybe you're machining a leaded steel, right? So you, you know that lead from uh, the leaded steel is now going to get in the fluid. And that's going to find its way into the environment or cadmium or some other nasties. Uh, fats, oils, and grease, a concern. Uh, things you're reading about now, eutrophication due to nutrient loading. Uh, and the, the chemical constituents themselves. Uh, some of the uh, chemistries that you're allowed to use in the US are actually banned in Europe because of concerns over health um, and exposure. Okay. So why do I think metalworking fluids are interesting to talk about? It's because it's got it all. right? It is uh, a case where um, they're essential. Because if you just stop using uh, cutting fluids, you're going to have to buy twice as many machine tools and hire twice as many people just to machine at the same rate to stay productive. And then you go out of business because the person next door is using cutting fluids. So you know, you'd like to just get rid of them uh, because it would solve a lot of problems. But people have been trying for decades, and you can't. Uh, so, uh, so there's an economic question. There is an environmental question. Uh, you know, these things are also expensive. Uh, they relate to the tools. There's a social issue, a health issue. Uh, it's all here. right? So. If we want to you know, think about being more sustainable, at least from the environmental perspective, you know, we would want these fluids to last longer with fewer inputs. And we would like them to be more stable. And at the same time, being higher performance, because there's nothing sustainable about fluids that don't work. Right? So this is where we would want to go. Now, how do we evaluate, right? particularly on this axis? Right? That's where LCA comes in. So our working example is going to look at two different metalworking fluids. Okay? So we're going to compare one metalworking fluid versus the next. We're going to apply LCA. And we're going to start with our first stage, which is, as you imagine it, uh, defining the purpose and the extent, the boundaries of the LCA. It also assures transparency. So we're talking about communication. right? A few of you brought that up, communicating it to others. What you do in the goal definition and scope, you've got to be clear, again, about what's in the analysis, what's outside the analysis. So if we apply this uh, now to understanding whether a vegetable oil-based metalworking fluid is environmentally superior to a petroleum oil metalworking fluid, we come up against a, one of the challenges of a, of a goal definition. Okay? Here, we're comparing two cutting fluids. Remember, I talked about 20 ingredients in a cutting fluid. How many of them are actually different between these two fluids? Okay. Well, uh, clearly the oil is different, because here we're going to use a rapeseed oil, and here we're going to use petroleum oil. So that's different. Well, the water itself may not be different, but I may use different amounts of water. So I've got to include the water. Uh, if I want a true vegetable oil-based metalworking fluid, then those surfactants better be bio-based. So I'm going to use bio-based surfactants here. I'll use petroleum-based, the common surfactants and the cheaper ones, with the petroleum oil uh, metalworking fluid. Okay? So at least the water, the oil, and the surfactants are different. Now there's roughly 15 other ingredients. And we assume in this study that they're the same, and therefore we can ignore them. So that's the difference, as it says down here, between a comparative LCA and an absolute LCA. A comparative LCA, if you're comparing A and B, and they have a lot of components in common, you can generally ignore them. It doesn't mean you can ethically ignore them, but you know, if, if one of the things you're ignoring turns out to be the issue, you know, it's, it's the chemical in both of them that kills people, and you don't bring it up, uh, that's a problem. In fact, it wouldn't make sense with something, the stakes being that high, to do you know, some energy analysis when that's not really the key issue, it turns out, in that fake example of being toxicology. Okay. But that's a comparative LCA where things may be in common, so you have some basis on which you may be able to ignore some components of the system. In an absolute LCA, that's not the case. If I, if I was just saying, you know, what is the life cycle environmental impacts of a petroleum-based metalworking fluid? 
then I got to include all those chemicals. Unless I can make some argument that one of them is really small and I can ignore it. Or one of the stages in the analysis, maybe it's transportation. It's minor, so I'm going to ignore it and I can prove that it's minor. Okay. So these are the types of decisions that you got to make up front. And I think this is the reason why many of you picked, or 80% of you picked this as the, the hardest stage. Okay. Even though I don't agree, uh, you know, that this is certainly a, a, a challenging step. But with practice, and when you read a lot of these, you get in the swing of it, and usually you can get through it. Scoping, uh, the other side of this equation, you know, determining what's inside and what's outside the boundary. Now here there's you know, greater challenge that many of you identified. Right, you're figuring out the boundaries, but not just the boundaries, the methodologies. I think a gentleman in the back mentioned you know, how you're going to determine the impact on a frog. There's different ways <laughs> to get there, and you know there's a ton of uncertainty. So what methodologies are you going to use? Right? Or maybe you're not talking about frogs at all. So you got to decide upon your methodologies that you're going to use in the, in the study. Uh, somebody else mentioned the data categories. Right? Do you have to include all the environmental impacts? Well, no. But if you don't include some environmental impacts, it needs to have some reason behind it. I mean, you can do an energy analysis of an energy using product because you know that's key. And maybe you qualitatively mentioned, you know, maybe some of the materials there are, you know, are toxic and further research needs to look into that. That might be fine. But again, like the crazy example I gave up, you know, comparing A and B and you look at this when that is the real problem. You're not allowed to do that. Okay, that will not pass peer review. Your assumptions need to be clear uh, and they need to be visible. Right? There's a difference between the two. You, know, you can say you're making an assumption, but it needs to be clear what that assumption is and how you came to it. And uncertainty analysis, sensitivity analysis is an important part of it. Okay? Comprehensible obviously needs to be understood and communicated well. Okay? So if we look at our cutting fluid example now, we're comparing the petroleum oil and water with the rapeseed oil and water. Uh, we have chosen, the, the dashed line here is our boundary. We're going to ignore the tools. We're going to ignore the work pieces. We're going to ignore the machining energy and all those additives I've already mentioned. We are going to look at the base oils. We're going to look at the surfactants. The, there's two types of surfactants, a non-ionic and anionic surfactant. Uh, one has a negative charge. The other is not charged. Gets into emulsion chemistry a bit, but uh, usually you've got uh, one of each at least. You can have two non-ionics. Uh, the water, and you got some things coming out. You got evaporation. Uh, you've got losses in the metalworking fluid system. Uh, you've got disposal, uh, which may involve pretreatment. Okay. So this is the decision that was made in this analysis, and I'm going to be writing this analysis, uh, you know, for for a while here. It's optional reading number 37. You're welcome to take a, a look at that. I'm going to go through the key points in this example. Uh, it's a very good read if you're interested in an LCA that's concise and clear uh, and you know, hopefully interesting. So you know, this is you know, where it gets more interesting, right? I mean, this is how do you get to your mineral oil that's in your petroleum-based cutting fluid? Uh, how do you get to your, your anionic surfactant for the uh, petroleum-based system, your sodium petroleum sulfonate, or your non-ionic, which is uh, diisopro uh, di diisopropanol amine. I think there's a spelling error there. Uh, and all the steps in between, right? Crude oil extraction is where a lot of this begins. Uh, there's some benzene involved if you're making sodium petroleum sulfonate, right? So you know, at this level, it looks easy. Then you say, OK, well, where, you know, where's that oil really coming from? How do I go from? You know, you know, the product to, to where it came from, what happened in between, where am I getting all that data? Right. And this is just the petroleum oil side of it. Right? The vegetable oil side clearly has got some farming involved, right? So plowing. It's not truly vegetable based in some sense, because you're going to use some diesel in the tractor. Right? So you go biodiesel, and okay, it's not very common, so it can begin to make assumptions, right? But ultimately, you get to your alcohol sulfate, your polyethoxylated glycol ester, and your rapeseed oil up here. A lot of processes, a lot of accounting. Each one, you look at the materials, energy going in. You look at the uh, air, um, water, and uh, solid waste emissions, hazardous waste emissions from each of those steps. Right? 
This is not for the person with a short attention span. Clearly, right? You gotta go on to the next to the next. It takes a long time to do it well. A lot of times, these individual steps have been looked up for you. So, uh, PhD student, now now a professor uh, who we did this study with, you know, took a lot of data from the literature. Okay, so there's some you know, rights and wrongs about how to do that. We'll talk about it. So there's some key definitions that come up as part of goal definition and scoping. Uh, the first is the function. Okay, you have to define what you're doing. So a metal working fluid may cool and lubricate. Maybe I'm talking about drying your hands in the lavatory in the bathroom. And uh, so I um, you know, need my hands dried. So that's a function. A function is a service that's provided usually by a system. The functional unit is something else. You know, this can be like a trick question on an exam, like what's a function and somebody describes a functional unit, or you say what's a functional unit and somebody describes a function. They're different. The function is what the system you're studying does. The functional unit is uh, a, a unit of measure. Okay, so basically, uh, you know, it's the number of hands dried. So you can think about like how many hands are dried in the big house per year and use that as a functional unit. Or it could be like two hands. Right? And, and that's important to have some measurable expression of the function because you're going to define a reference flow from that functional unit. So that's our third definition here, reference flow. So how many paper towels does it take for you to dry two hands? Is it one or is it 50? Right, we've all seen the person with 50 of them, right? Just keep going and like, yeah, just, right, take a stack of them. So these are assumptions, right? And you don't get guidelines. Go back to Sarah's point earlier, like, you know, how do you decide what a good LCA or a bad LCA is, right? You know, let's suppose I'm a person who makes hand dryers, okay? And, oh, I want to do an LCA that makes my hand dryers look good. Right, so this is the blowing kind, right, with the heat. Maybe it's a Dyson thing, I don't know. Uh, and uh, the, so I just, you know, I'm going to have an LCA commission. I'm going to pay some professor who doesn't have very good scruples uh, to do an LCA. And, um, you know, hopefully they're going to assume that it's 50 towels per each hand, right? That would be a bad assumption. Actually, looking at who sponsored the study is important, too. And that's why you like to see these in peer-reviewed journals where, you know, if the sponsorship is uh, tied to a beneficial outcome, uh, you know, you know that that has been vetted in a very vigorous and rigorous way. Function, functional unit, reference flow. Questions? Is it clear? Is the reference flow always in, uh, does it always <coughs> correspond to the functional unit like volume of air per hand, mass of paper? It has to, hand? yeah, okay. it does. So having a reference flow that's unrelated to the function of the functional unit doesn't make sense. Uh, so that's a poorly defined reference flow, and that would be a fatal flaw in an LCA. And one thing I didn't measure, mention, uh, <coughs> I'm not 100% sure, but I'm about 90% sure. We're going to talk about the computational structure of an LCA. So there's some math. It's simple linear math. It's, I don't know, multiplication. Yeah, it's just, you know, linearly additive stuff. Right? That's basically what an LCA is. And you can express it in matrix form if you choose. But the point about mentioning that is LCAs are linear. And they scale to your reference flow. So defining what your reference flow is and being very clear about it is important. So you know, if I want to scale you know, two hands to the big house, and I can assume how many people are in the stadium or using the restrooms in a given game, now I can come up with some impact associated with drying hands per football game. Right. A linearly scaled LCAs are linear. Stuff? The uh, reference flow, for example, if you look at the uh, drying hands example, it could be the amount of air, volume of air that the blower put, you know, blows out. It could be the amount of electricity it uses. Is there something specific? Well, it won't be the amount of electricity. 
because that is essentially an input to the system, right? So the, f the flow, the reference flow, attaches to the function. So you're not using electricity directly to dry your hands, although you could. I mean, it'd be kind of interesting, right? Uh, but uh, I got the engineer minds uh, turning out there. But uh, so it is directly attached. But what you define as reference flow, right? That is a judgment call. Yes. Does all every system ha necessarily have something like that, like a car? Uh, I will challenge you to find one that doesn't. For a car, it's uh, you know uh, passenger miles traveled, right? It has to do with the function, and you can do other things with cars. You can make statues out of them, and, you know. Uh, but yeah, for every system, you can define it, and there's multiple ways of doing it. And judgment and experience is the way to do it well. There's a lot of common sense involved. Steve. So are there guidelines for? putting together reference flow in like the ISO uh, 1440. That you need a reference flow, and then they give you a few examples like we're doing here, and then they set you off on your own. Like I said, it's general. Go ahead. Uh, do we take the reference flow as a average or the upper limit, as in one person could take one paper towel to dry his hands? Another yeah, you don't take the one person that does 50 and say that's general, right? So we're going to talk about data quality in a couple of minutes, and representativeness is a key aspect of data quality. You don't take the upper end. You tend toward the averages. But it doesn't hurt, and depending on the system, it might actually matter what one person does. You know, if you're talking about toxicology, right, and I'm going to drink like, you know, uh, 50 sodas a day, and I'm thinking about the life cycle of that, maybe I could even give a health impact on that. I may want to look at that case. But it just depends on the system we're talking about. For products, usually you go toward the average. Saturday game at the at the big house, and the next Saturday, suppose it's 25, 25 paper towels. For the next Saturday game, it might be 27, but there'll be those two extra ones that are. So this is variation, and what you're talking about is sensitivity analysis to assumptions. You're going to assume there's a certain capacity in the stadium, a certain number of people drying their hands in the restrooms. Uh, that may be a point guess or an average. You may have actually collected data. But you do uncertainty analysis as part of a sensitivity. Uh, and we'll, I'll show you an example of that in, in a minute or so. Pete? Um, does LCA ever involve like, the element of time at all? Like, say, how long you use a product for? Yeah, it, a good one will. And uh, too many of them don't. But you know, if you think about a product that's long lived, uh, when the emissions occur really matter. Uh, and I've got an example of that, that why don't I just go ahead and spoil? So uh, you know, if you look at, no, I have it in this lecture. Okay, I just thought of it. So Pete, I'll come back to that point. Time's really important, uh, and it gets ignored too often. And in the list of things that are important for data quality, time is there. Not just time in terms of when the emissions occur, but time in terms of if you're going to use data from the literature, when was that collected? Because technology evolves too. So time's really important to look at, and you know, it's sort of one of my pet peeves. Doesn't get looked at enough. Uh, so there's a lot of good examples on, on that topic. Okay. You all getting the hang of this? So just to go to our uh, metalworking fluid system now. So I just took from reading 37. Um, these are just statements of what the function and function of the unit are. So metalworking fluids are used as coolants and lubricants in metal cutting and forming to extend the life of tools and achieve faster production rates. The functional unit tied to that is the service of a metalworking fluid uh, provided to one machine tool right here uh, for one year. Um, and the reason that was selected was, you know, you might like to have it be per part, right? But, you know, different parts may have different amounts of cutting fluid, and you may recirculate the, the fluid even when you're not machining, okay? So uh, what this basically means is, uh, in, in the assumption that's embedded here, is when you're machining, you're recirculating the fluid. There's a, uh, a sump down here where that uh, fluid is pooled up. And you basically got a pump that might be sending that fluid at the cutting zone, say, five gallons a minute or something like that. Right? So there's energy involved there. And you're going to do that for as many parts as you machine. And what we're using here is machining time in a year. And basically, in this case, we looked at a, uh, what we thought was a typical um, uh, factory out in uh, 
well in the greater Detroit area and um, went from there. Okay, so it's basically the, the use of a cutting fluid at a machine tool for a year. Okay, so that's a functional unit. So here's our second axiom of the day, the unequal functionality axiom. So if I come back to the function, the function is to extend the life of the tool. It may turn out that one of those fluids does that job better. Right? Nothing's ever the same. So uh, and sometimes they're close enough to being the same so you can ignore the differences. But this study that I'm referring to, reading number 37, actually looks not just at petroleum-based and vegetable-based cutting fluids. They look at uh, some alternatives to that, where the tool life actually changes a lot. So if you ignore that, you know, maybe you can make the tools last longer, well, then you probably should be including the tools. And the fact that you're not is a deficiency. And it may be one that the reviewers will live with, just because you don't have the data. And this is a cutting fluid study, after all. But you've got to recognize that uh, things are never really the same. So you've got to be looking uh, for the differences. One thing I can tell you about a vegetable oil versus a petroleum oil-based cutting fluid, as we've formulated them in this study, uh, the, the vegetable-based cutting fluids last longer. They last a lot longer uh, without deteriorating. So the surface life is actually going to be longer, but here we're assuming it's the same. Yeah. So nothing is truly ever equal, and that obviously is going to complicate your interpretation of the functional unit. Sir? As far as the um, reference flow for this example, what, what would that be? Would that be like the amount of fluid used to maintain one tool? Or so think of it as gallons one? used at a machine tool in a year. And how those gallons are determined is by how long you machine in a year. And then if you're recirculating at five gallons a minute, and you know how many minutes you've machined, that's essentially um, the, um, the service that's been provided. Now, your fluid isn't going to last a year. So there's going to be an assumption in here is how often you dumped it in that year. Right? So there's some nominal value there. That's an assumption that's going to come up in a minute. Uh, do you assume that both these fluids have uh, same lubrication properties? Or? Yeah, we do. And actually, they don't. So that's an excellent point. So the vegetable oil one also has better lubrication performance. The reason why most cutting fluids are petroleum-based is because they're less expensive, number one. And two, traditionally, the vegetable oil-based cutting fluids, uh, they have a problem when you recirculate them. They gum, gum up the uh, machine tools, and there's this oxidative stability issue. So they, don't, um, you know, they, they cause some challenges for maintenance. A lot of those have been addressed today, uh, but they're still more expensive. So from a standpoint of performance, though, in terms of in machining and lubrication, the vegetable oil ones are better. Do you achieve uh, better production rates with? Uh, you, your tools in certain operations will last longer. But again, that's outside of our system. Okay. Getting the hang of this. Reference flow. OK, so this is just the time. So 102 hours a week. 42 weeks a year. You can convert that to minutes per year. And then gallons per minute, that's your pumping energy. That's important because that turns out to be important, uh, significant in the study. And then you got to think about your uh, disposal rate. Okay. So uh, the nominal is once per two months. And that's pretty conservative. It's for a single machine tool where you're not really maintaining uh, or filtering, doing anything uh, significant, then it's usually going to be a little bit more than that. Now, I put the utilization rate in gray here. Uh, it's five gallons a minute. It actually doesn't matter because you're going to use the, uh, the, the petroleum-based fluid and the vegetable-based fluid um, at the same rate. So if it's five gallons a minute for one, you'll use it at the other. So you, in principle, you could ignore that. But we didn't because, uh, as I mentioned before, there's some other non-traditional cutting fluids that we're looking at in the study. So it's actually included here, but in a true comparison, you wouldn't need to. So the results I'm going to present, that turns out to be significant, uh, even though in the comparison, it's not really significant. Does that make sense? OK, still got you here? OK, so uh, just a little bit more on the boundaries. So if you're going to exclude something from your system, you've got to say what it is, 
uh, and you need to describe why and how you did it. So there are different criteria for excluding a unit process. So you might say, well, you know, it's two percent, less than two percent of the mass flow. So I'm going to ignore it, or it's less than two percent of the energy consumption. So I'm going to ignore it. Uh, you know, those are dangerous things, especially with the cutting fluids example. Like think of a biocide, right? That's less than two percent of the mass, and certainly less than two percent of the energy in terms of the life cycle of the system. But that one additive can have significant human health issues associated with it, right? So that's where this environmental relevance, in my view, is the right way to do it. Uh, I think, so my personal view is that you, know, you look across all the impact categories that you're studying, and hopefully you're studying the relevant ones. And if it's insignificant in all those, like less than 2% of the impact, then just go ahead and ignore it. Now this is what's also tricky about goal definition and scope. That's why so many of you, I think, again, voted for that. Is, you, know, you, need, you almost need the LCA done to know whether something is relevant or not. Right, so that's tricky. I mean, how do you know that something's less than 2% of the impact before you studied it? Yeah, it's good luck with that, right? Uh, there, um, you know, what I recommend about that is like, don't bite off more than you can chew. Do a rough analysis up front. And then if it's looking like, even under the most conservative assumptions, you know, you're a factor of two away from being relevant, or a factor of five away from being relevant, relevant meaning like two to five percent. Uh, then you're safe to ignore it. But you have to justify it. That's the point. You don't necessarily need to do an LCA. You need reasoning that peer reviewers are going to accept. So criteria for exclusion. Does that make sense? Intuitive? OK, so data quality. The, we've already hit most of these. Now, where are you going to get the data from? Are you going to measure it yourself? You know, uh, uh, Andres Clarence uh, did that, that work back in uh, 2007, 2008. He's a professor now down in Virginia. He would still be here you know, a third of the way through this if he was measuring each one of those processes himself. Right. Uh, building from the literature is OK, but you have to use your data sources consistently. So if your surfactant production was done in Germany, uh, and uh, that surfactant production may look different in the US, but you don't have data in the US, then do a German study. And be very clear about it. Use all your data from Germany. And that happens a lot, because they do a lot more LCAs. Right? Uh, so actually, this is a German study, the, the LCA I'm presenting here. Uh, so you have to be consistent. So if your surfactant production is German, your electricity grid better be German too. Right? So things need to be consistent. And that's the biggest trick with using you know, uh, data from the literature. And, and this is where so I get asked to peer review LCAs. Uh, yeah, that's where I, yeah, that's like the first place I look. Because it's like a red flag. If somebody bothered to be completely consistent, the rest of it's probably perfect. Right? But you know, if, if that's inconsistent, you don't even need to read the rest of it. It's like, OK, you know, go figure out how to do this. Uh, it's just not appropriate to be using inconsistent data sources. Uh, you can use calculation. If you know roughly you know, you got a combustion process and about 1% of the carbon is going to end up as carbon monoxide, and the other 99% is going to be CO2. You know, calculations and, and mass balances, totally fair game. So when we get to environmental systems analysis and we talk about mass balances, which some of you haven't seen or thought about, uh, you know, we'll actually tie it back to LCA, because LCA is essentially mass and energy balances. So you can calculate or estimate. We talked about time. Pete asked a great question there. I just mentioned geography. Uh, technologies, different technologies, uh, you know, to uh, produce different products. Okay, uh, think about that. You know, I'm, if maybe I'm using CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, as a cutting fluid, where did I get that CO2 from? What technologies were used to produce it? Right. Uh, makes a big difference in terms of its environmental impact. Right, your sources. Did it come from the literature? Uh, and are those literature sources consistent? 
uh, precision and reproducibility are two different things. So you know, going back to that big house example, right? If I want to know how many people use the restrooms, you know, hopefully I don't just go to one game, even though it tends to be sold out all the time. So it's probably not that much variation. Uh, but uh, you know, you want to have a feeling for uh, not just a point estimate, but the distribution about that point estimate. So reproducibility is different from precision because I may be able to reproduce a distribution. But that distribution may be wide, so any given estimate may not be that precise because there's large variability. So precision, reproducibility, not the same thing. Consistency refers to uh, typically your data sources, but not just your data sources, your methodology. Right? If you're determining um, carcinogenicity, like the car cancer causing potential of a, uh, of a chemical, you can't use one method for this chemical and another method for that chemical without a really good justification. Right? Otherwise, it just looks like you're cherry picking to try to get a result. Okay, So all of these uh, factors uh, relate to how a reviewer of an LCA will look at its quality. Now, allocation is another issue. How many people know what uh, allocation means in the context of an LCA? OK, uh, so that's two. So let's go back to CO2 as an example. OK, I'm going to make a cutting fluid based on carbon dioxide. We'll talk about that later in the term. I need that CO2. But CO2 is not something I make on its own, right? So CO2 exists in the atmosphere. You know, I could come up with a machine uh, to take that CO2 right out of the air. But that's kind of silly, right? Because there's CO2 everywhere, right? You make ethanol, you get CO2. You drive a car, you get CO2. You make ammonia, fertilizer, you get CO2. Natural gas, you get CO2, right? So CO2 is everywhere. So if I want to have CO2 as an input, I need to make some decision about where that CO2 came from. So uh, in the study in 37, that CO2 we used, uh, that uh, we assumed came from ammonia production. There are a number of different ways, and ethanol is a growing one, uh, to get CO2. Uh, but we chose ammonia and fertilizer production because that was the most common. But it was really only you know, just above you know, 50 60%. Right? Uh, you know, and that may look different than you know, just grabbing it from a natural gas well. Right? So just randomly pulling data sources, you need to think about issues that we've already discussed. But in addition, if it's a co-product, so CO2 would be defined as a co-product of ammonia production. So how do you treat the environmental burdens associated with creating the CO2 when you're actually after the ammonia? Right, so there's different ways you can do that. Typically, what the ISO 14000 standards will tell you is do something like a mass allocation. So I look at the mass of CO2 and the mass of ammonia. Well, it's just about 50-50. So half the burdens go to CO2, and half go to ammonia. Well, that sounds kind of silly, right? Because you didn't run this process for the CO2. You ran it because you wanted the ammonia. There's other ways to get CO2. Uh, now, you, so you can go by the price, right? So here's the price of CO2, and here's the price of ammonia per ton. So basically, if you add the two up, the CO2 is about one-sixth of the total. So we'll give one-sixth of the burdens to uh, CO2. Now, uh, and, and that's, you know, you can do a price allocation. But you can see the weaknesses in both of these, right? Because, again, you know, maybe I would have made the ammonia anyway. Or maybe you know, this relationship looks very, very different for ethanol or in the, the case of natural gas production. Especially on the mass case, right? If I'm making, uh, maybe I'm producing methane or ethanol. It's just you know, NH3 and you know, ethanol, whatever its molecular weight is. Um, you know, it's kind of a random thing that may have nothing to do with the impacts themselves. Right? You can also do it on volume allocation, but you have the same problem. When we talk about consequential LCA starting next period, uh, what we're going to you know, we're going to start looking at this more like a market. So let's suppose that I make a cutting fluid based out of CO2. You know, does that change the price of CO2? Is that going to create more CO2? Is it going to lead 
to more CO2 being produced than otherwise would have been produced. Right? That's a consequential LCA. It's not an ISO LCA. But it's connecting the market to these kinds of decisions. It's up to you to decide whether that's more realistic or not. Okay? So that's where we were wrapping up last time. Uh, we talked about a number of characteristics of good data sets. And uh, so if we apply those characteristics to the metalworking fluid case study that we're looking at, remember we were comparing a mineral oil-based metalworking fluid with a rapeseed oil-based vegetable oil uh, cutting fluid. And uh, again, this is coming from optional reading 37. And there's a paragraph here I wanted to share with you talking about data representativeness and geography. So if we look at that example, a uh, line from the paper or paragraph goes like this. Uh, the reference country for the analysis is Germany, uh, since data on the bio-based oil and the surfactant production were complete and readily available in the literature under a German scenario. Uh, therefore, to be consistent, water production and electricity generation were also based on German data. You know, here we are in Ann Arbor doing this study, and we uh, used a German perspective so that it would be internally uh, consistent. Uh, emissions associated with the transportation of metalworking fluids from production facilities to use facilities were excluded because they were expected to be negligible. So talking about data, so we're going to now apply this German scenario. Uh, we don't know exactly where the facilities are. We could look them up, but what we did was, well, let's just assume that the distances are really large and then compare them against the data set. And the question is whether we would expect that the transportation is significant. The answer is no. So uh, we didn't actually have to go up and uh, go, go out and, and look up those facilities because the transportation was expected to be um, not a major factor in the analysis. So uh, looking at the middle of the slide here, uh, these are uh, basically the references that were pulled together to formulate the inventory. So if we look at the base oil, uh, came from reference number nine in that paper, and you can't read these references down here. It's just to show you a clean way of how references can be consolidated and presented. Uh, you've got the crude oil from which the mineral oil is derived. You've got the rapeseed oil. Uh, you've got the surfactants. All of them have their own references. Now, uh, the question becomes: Okay, you know, are the scenarios of these references uh, truly the same? And, and they're not. So. A big part of the LCA is understanding each step in each process for each of these studies and making sure that it makes sense in the context of the analysis you're putting together. Okay. So you know, a lot of folks think of LCA as this sort of glorious field, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot of accounting, it's a lot of, a, a lot of patience, uh, a lot of uh, being meticulous. Yeah, go ahead. Understand why each part of the fluid has a different source. Uh, well, and in the well if somebody had done the study already, then we wouldn't have had to do it, right? So what you're really looking at here is a chemistry that is an assembly of water, surfactant, and oil. Uh, nobody had looked at the three at the same time, so uh, we took from the literature the components, assembled them uh, in a consistent way. We hope. And a lot of the use of the fluids actually came from our own measurements and our own interviews of factories here in, in Michigan, uh, people we knew who also were um, uh, conducting manufacturing operations uh, for a major auto company in, in the area here in Germany. So uh, basically the representativeness uh, dictated that since either we're going to go out and take the measurements ourselves, in which case you know, the student would still be here you know, seven years later, or uh, you know, we could borrow from the literature if appropriate. And we made the case in, in the article, and you can look at 37 there to uh, judge for yourself whether we did a good job of that. And if the answer is no, I'd be happy to know that. That would be fine. But, uh, this was a paper in environmental science and technology. Other questions? It's an excellent one. It's clear? The other part of this, you know, we talked about allocation last time. Uh, we should also spend a minute to discuss uncertainty analysis and sensitivity. So, you know, especially when, when we started looking at how these metalworking fluids are actually used in industry, uh, there's very large 
variation in practice from, I mean, it could be one end of the factory to the other end of the factory, quite literally. Or, you know, an operation that the same company is doing in the U.S. and in Germany. So what we decided to do here was to take you know, the widest reasonable range of parameters that uh, would influence our outcome. So, you know, we create a, um, a spreadsheet. And let's suppose we're looking at energy. Energy is going to depend on the rate at which we're blasting this process with these metalworking fluids. So we're pumping them around anywhere from one to five gallons a minute. So clearly the energy, uh, you know, the pumping energy is going to have a significant impact on the results. Now, different places may use different flow rates, even different pressures. That's going to affect the energy. So in this case, for the uh, petroleum oil and water-based metalworking fluid, we look at somewhere from uh, just above three and a half liters a minute all the way up to 38 liters a minute. Now, we do this really for two reasons. One is you know, we want to avoid the case where somebody comes back and say, you know what, at our factory, we use like 600 liters a minute. Okay. Now, it turns out in the time since we've done this, high pressure water uh, has been touted as an option that works fairly well in these systems. So, uh, you can easily imagine this number being much higher. That was not common uh, back when we, we did this study. So, you know, sometimes you can never avoid that is the point. But the other, the second point is that when you're doing these analyses, usually you're trying to say something. Trying to say that, you know, maybe you know, vegetable oil, uh, metalworking fluids are the way to go. Or you may be trying to say, you know what, everybody thinks Vegetable oil, metalworking fluids are the way to go. But when you add up the numbers, it turns out there's no basis for that. Right? So the, you generally formulate uh, your LCA with some question in mind. And the reason for doing a sensitivity analysis such as this in a wide range, you want to make sure that whatever you're trying to say is robust to the variation and the parameters that you just don't know. Okay? Is that idea making sense to folks? Go ahead. Do you do it for every parameter? Or how do you decide which Well, if you know that the number is 6.2, it's 6.2. And, and you can justify it. And you put it in your paper. And everybody knows it's 6.2, so no point in looking at 6.3. Yes, if you're doing due diligence, yes. And, and that is the iterative, messy nature of LCA. Because now you've gone out and you've collected all these data and you've done these studies. And it turns out that something you don't know matters a lot. Like you're trying to decide between these two cutting fluids. And it turns out it's the use of pesticides. It's all about pesticides at the end of the day, at the end of the day or whatever it is. Now you've got to go out and become a pesticides expert before you can finish your study if you're going to say what you set out to say about maybe it's about toxics in water or something like that, right? We might have thought that uh, perhaps it's the, I'm just making stuff up at this point, point. You know, the petroleum-based surfactants have a high toxicity, and therefore you know, the water pollution coming from these surfactants really are a major deal. But then you go do this LCA and you figure out, oh, I forgot about the pesticides. So now you have to go out and really understand the variation in pesticide application as it would relate to you know, a milliliter of the fluid of the oil that comes here. And maybe it just took a general rapeseed oil um, case study. And it turns out that the field from which that data came from, you know, that oil never would end up in a metalworking fluid. right? So you, you go in there and you, you dive in deeper. Right? Now, hopefully, you've done a lot of that up front. But uh, it's almost inevitable that some of it you haven't, because you, you kind of iterate once you have some results. You realize where the weaknesses in your data are. You go back and you fill them in. So it's a messy, complicated, long business. Other questions? So this is all sort of set up, right? Then you know the, the inventory process itself is actually fairly straightforward. It's, it's addition and accounting, right? This is, a, this is Microsoft Excel stuff. And uh, you know, so if we, if we look at the formal definition of an inventory uh, in ISO, it's a technical database process of quantifying energy and raw material requirements, atmospheric emissions, waterborne emissions, solid waste, and other releases for the entire life cycle of a product, process, 
or activity. Okay. And there's some you know, fine print at the bottom you may not be able to read, but it basically says, you know, seems easy enough, uh, except that, as I was just saying, you know, there's some paradox using LCA because you're using it to answer a question, but you, you don't really know the answer to the question until you already do it. And once you do the LCA, the question might change. So there is this sort of interplay. Further, if you're using LCA in design, typically you're designing things that don't exist. Or for, and, and because they don't exist, there's no LCA for it. Right? LCA is backward looking. It's not forward looking. And that's, you know, we tend to think, oh, let's use LCA in design. And we do. But in doing so, we've got to recognize that these numbers come from things that exist. And they existed in the past. It doesn't mean they'll exist in the future. By virtue of the fact that you're making this product, you may change the supply chain system entirely. Right? So that's possible. It doesn't usually happen, but these are things that you need to keep in mind. So there's a paradox using LCA in design. Uh, the other thing to recognize in the inventory stage is that economic factors are not considered. Okay, so LCA is not a sustainability analysis if we, dis if we uh, uh, define a sustainability analysis as looking at uh, economic factors and social factors in addition to environmental factors. And it's not, it's not even an environmental sustainability analysis because environmental sustainability is a nexus of economics and the environment. And LCA is just environment. Right. Third issue here as we've discussed, you know, where's that data going to come from? So we've already talked about where the data is going to come from in our um, metalworking fluid case study. So this is the image we've looked at already. Bunch of unit processes within the system boundary that you defined in the goal definition and scoping phase. So you got an assemblage of unit processes constituting the life cycle within the boundaries. For each of those unit processes, you've got raw materials and energy coming in. You've got the emissions going out, potentially co-products. We talked about allocation last time. And if you have co-products, then you need to uh, partition or allocate uh, those uh, associated emissions with each of the co-products. Okay. So drilling down now, we look at the unit process. Again, it's the same thing. Energy and resources coming in. Here you talk about materials as a resource and water as a resource. Uh, you've got uh, products and co-products. You have your air, water, and solid waste coming out. And uh, you, know, you can't see these. This is just a reminder. You know, this is a high-level machine tool to which we were applying these two different metalworking fluids. And when we talked about the mineral oil metalworking fluid, we asked where did the oil come from. Then we had this sort of uh, very intricate uh, process flow diagram. And there are even further unit processes within here. So if we were talking about uh, the vegetable oil metalworking fluid, you might remember that there was you know, this farming that had to happen. There was one box there called plowing. Well, what is plowing, right? Plowing involves capital equipment. All right, it involves um, uh, diesel fuel. Uh, where did the diesel come from, right? So you get more and more processes, and the next thing you know, you end up in Siberia. So that's why we have these, um, uh, what we call the guidelines for uh, allocating uh, what's in the system, and sort of defining what's in the system and what's not in the system. Okay. So that's what's going on. At the end of the day, you get a spreadsheet. So this was Andre's uh, spreadsheet. It's not included in reading 37, but this is uh, one screenshot. So this is the energy tab in the Excel spreadsheet. What you're looking at here, based on certain assumptions regarding the flow rate, uh, what are the uh, emissions now? So you see things like carbon monoxide and NOx and sulfur oxides, et cetera. You see ozone depletion potential. These are midpoint impact metrics I'll say more about in, in a few minutes here. Right? So this is just the energy tab. He's also got a raw materials tab. He's got an assumptions tab, a uh, production tab uh, for the uh, uh, compiling the data from the two studies, or the four studies we actually talked about for uh, the surfactants and for the oils. Uh, he's got a use phase tab. He's got an end of life tab. He's got a wastewater treatment plant uh, tab and um, looking at uh, recovery options for the fluids, so microfiltration, recycling, and incineration. So you see this is, again, it's for the patient. right? And this took a long time to do. This is uh, 
one way to express the data in a spreadsheet. And you're looking at energy. So this is an inventory analysis. We're just looking at one metric from the inventory analysis energy. Remember, our functional unit was to serve a machine tool at a plant for a year. So the uh, output here, energy, is expressed as megajoules per year. And he's looking at two sensitivity parameters that are very important with respect to the life cycle energy, as you can tell by the slopes here. So the one is, how long does a fluid last? Am I replacing it once a week or once a year? And everything in, in between. And then the other, as we talked about just a few minutes ago, flow rate. So how much pumping energy are you applying at you know, each, each minute you're uh, machining? Okay, so going from one all the way up to 15 gallons a minute here. And you can see that these two, so A is the petroleum-based fluid, B is the, uh, is the vegetable oil-based fluid. They don't look very different. And the bullet in the middle is about what we think is normal, most common. Right, if we were to put a probability density function, you know, the corners are a lot less likely. Uh, but we didn't. Okay. So this is why you, you, uh, you do the uncertainty analysis, right? I mean, the question uh, that was asked before was, do you do a uncertainty analysis uh, for every parameter? You say yes for everything that you're unsure about and could make a big difference. Now suppose we didn't do that. It turns out that this bullet is just a little bit higher than this bullet, right? We can make a mountain out of a molehill. The fact is they are not different with respect to the uncertainty in the system. Okay. And this is behavioral uncertainty, so there's nothing you can do about it. It's not like data uncertainty, where you could go out and measure and maybe refine your estimate. Here, these are just different practices in different places. There's not a whole lot you can do about that, but you've got to report it. Unless you know exactly which process. This wouldn't have been a very interesting paper, right? If we talked about one machining process in, in one town in Germany, you know, one machine, I mean, it wouldn't be very applicable, right? So uh, at the end of the day, you know, we wanted to look at the broad range. And in terms of energy, it doesn't tell us a whole lot, at least for these two systems. Now, there are other cutting fluids we looked at we'll talk about later in the term. Is this clear? All right, inventory analysis is pretty boring, right? I mean, it's just like, OK, let's uh, uh, plot the data that we've uh, pulled together. And this is just a table form for some nominal assumptions, the bullet points. And you know, what I'd like to get across with this slide is that some of these data are impact metrics, and some of these data are inventory. So water use is inventory. You're just adding up the water. Not saying anything about where the water came from or whether water may have been scarce from the place you took it. You're just adding up the total water use. Okay, so there's no impact metric. It's just your usage of water. Uh, same goes for uh, for land use and for solid waste and for non-renewable energy. Okay, and you can actually see here in terms of the non-renewable energy. So there's renewable energy and non-renewable energy. In terms of non-renewable, it turns out the rapeseed oil uses more, which may surprise people. But if uh, you followed the corn-based ethanol uh, discussion going on for biofuels, uh, maybe it doesn't surprise you. Uh, let's see. Uh, you've got some things uh, we haven't talked about, like ecotoxicity, expressed as uh, grams of lead equivalents per year emitted, global warming potential and acidification potential. You know, we'll talk more about those, uh, what are called midpoint impact metrics uh, j in just a little bit. So those, I, I single them out because they're not inventory outcomes. These are impact stage outcomes. Making sense? Okay, what can you do with an inventory analysis? Well, you can rank individual stages. You know, for instance, when I dispose of a water-based cutting fluid, uh, I don't have any water consumed at the end of life phase. OK, maybe that was obvious. Maybe it wasn't. Uh, but the ecotoxicity, maybe I didn't know that you know, the production stage really isn't a big deal relative to the end of life stage in terms of toxic materials getting into the environment. All right, so you can use inventory results to rank contributions from individual stages or individual processes. 
You can also use it as a baseline for improvement. Perhaps I've proposed a rapeseed oil-based cutting fluid, the vegetable-based cutting fluid, as an improvement to petroleum, and now I can compare them. Right? Or maybe I have a completely different type of cutting fluid I want to compare to these. Okay? So it's a baseline for improvement, and that can, of course, support uh, government policy, industrial decision making. It can also be a basis on which products are certified. Right? So product labeling, uh, life cycle inventory is commonly used for that. As I've mentioned already, as you go through, you might realize that you've got some data gaps. Okay. Uh-oh, I, I just realized that pesticides are an issue, so now I need to go study pesticides or land use, et cetera. So uh, you may identify data gaps. And perhaps most importantly, you can't do an impact analysis without an inventory analysis. So I can imagine some interesting test questions coming up, like, okay, can you do interpretation without inventory? Can you do uh, scoping without impact? You know, you could have some fun with, you know, what's actually precedent over another, but you cannot do an impact analysis without an inventory analysis because you don't have any data. Okay. We clear on inventory. This is just an inventory analysis from a circa 1990s vehicle, a large car and a small car, just looking at different criteria pollutants, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, uh, NOx, methane, sulfur dioxide. And it's interesting. I mean, you see, at least for the energy consumption, that the use phase dominates tends to be what we think. Uh, but what this LCA taught me that I didn't know, I remember when this came out, when I was a graduate student, you know, that you know, if you're thinking about sulfur and methane, you know, methane's a potent greenhouse gas. Uh, you're thinking about NOx, you know, the, the uh, fuel supply chain is quite important, uh, particularly as, as cars get bigger. Right? And at that time, there was really no hope that the CAFE standards were going to go up. So uh, you, know, you can use the LCA for insight with respect to processes or specific stages of the life cycle. Okay. Anybody surprised by this? Probably not. I guess we're thinking a lot about cars these days and use phase dominating. Uh, but for some of these pollutants that don't come out the tailpipe, the fuel production stage is, is quite important, as, as well as the manufacturing stage. I know these colors are a little bit hard to make out, but the uh, use and retirement's on the top here, and the production's on the bottom. 